Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is North Carolina Museum Week, brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. This week, we are celebrating the museum and uh, of course museums all across the state and the great work that museums do in the great state of North Carolina. Here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, we have a collection of more than four and a half million specimens. Specimens made available to researchers and the public right through our exhibits where you can learn more about the natural world. Uh, a collection, the things that we've brought into the museum for scientific study and for display make up sort of the, the foundation of what a natural history museum like ours is and what they do. But of course, these things aren't just dusty drawers and jars being stored in cabinets and in basements. Uh, they are active parts of research. Our museum, in fact, is an active research institution. And so all week, every day here at lunchtime, we're bringing you conversations with some of our research curators and the collections managers of those collections so that you can learn a little bit more about what's going on at the museum and ask your questions. My name is Chris. I am curator for the SECU Daily Planet Theater, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's program. But joining me is the research curator for ichthyology, Dr. Alex Dornberg. Alex, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. And the collections manager for ichthyology, Gabriella Hogue. Gabriella, thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, Let's jump right in. Um, Gabriella, I'll start with you since you're the collections manager. Uh, tell us a little bit about the ichthyology collection itself. Well, um, the, you know, the museum was founded and one of the reasons why the museum was founded so that it, we could bring to all of North Carolina all of the biodiversity within the state. And so back when the Brimley brothers founded the museum, they started collecting and mounting a lot of specimens and putting things out there that the general public might not necessarily see like uh, you know, a marlin or a shark, things like that, uh, that were really interesting. And it also told them so much more about their state. And so the collection was founded back then. Um, our collection goes all the way back. Our oldest specimen is from 1850. Uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, and so we have we have smattering of specimens from uh, the from the 1850s to the late 1800s. And then it really um, picks up in the 1930s um, and then is uh, much uh, heavier focused in the 1950s and, and from then on. But the fish collection, we've got about 1.4 million specimens, um, which is a lot of specimens. Uh, and it's incredibly diverse, both freshwater and marine specimens. Um, it is not just a collection made up of things that we collected. So our collection is uh, basically a conglomerate of a lot of collections that have come together over the years. So um, when other institutions or other museums or other agencies, they might change their focus on what they're doing or possibly a curator retires uh, at a university um, and a different curator comes in that handles a different taxa, uh, collections become what are termed orphaned. And so they need homes. And so over the years, we've incorporated a lot of other collections within our collections. Like I said, those 1.4 million aren't just things we collected, but they're things from all other, all these other institutions that have come together and also state agencies that have come together and voucher their specimens with us in case there's ever a question about an identification or its locality. Certain species need to be what are termed vouchered or deposited within our institution uh, so they can be looked at later. So um, we're a pretty large collection. Um, we're the fifth largest regional repository, meaning we basically cover the Southeast. So the Brimley brothers started with North Carolina, right? Let's see what's in North Carolina. And quickly, of course, we, we realize, you know, uh, 
fish and all other taxes, they don't understand those boundaries of states. It's not like they're not going to swim over to the other side because it's South Carolina. And so our collection is mainly focused within the southeastern United States. That's our biggest focus. But we do have um, 62 countries represented within our collection. And that, of course, has to do with all of those collections that have come in, sort of the conglomerate that make up ours. And um, so it makes it very varied, as I said uh, before, lots of fresh water, lots of salt water. And collections also um, depend, they, they can depend when they're, where they're from, depending on the research focus of the curator and the staff at the institution. So if someone had a research focus, say in South America, that's why we've got some South American specimens or California, we've got some specimens from California, things like that. So um, that's kind of a very broad overview. I could talk about the collection all day, so I'll stop there. Um, but um, yeah, feel free to ask anything else and we can keep going. Yeah, great. So yeah, no, that was a perfect overview, uh, even more in depth than I thought we were going to go right out, right off the bat, but that was great. Um, I didn't realize that we had so many countries represented in our collection as well. We really do have a, a great smattering of global uh, specimens going on there, even though we're pretty focused on the Southeast, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense. That's where the museum is located. But you did mm -hmm. mention uh, research that goes on with the collection. So I'm going to ask uh, the research curator, Alex, tell us a little bit about the work that's going on with the collection or a little bit about uh, your research. Sure. So, I mean, just to back up globally, um, museums just have a central role in research that I think people often don't realize. Um, so specimens can get loaned out to scientists all over the world um, to accomplish their research. So you can, you know, think about, you know, oh, okay, we want to maybe verify, like Gabriella was saying, is was this, this animal truly here? Because we do tend to have this bias where we're living in the present and we know everything. The people who lived before us knew nothing. Um, so a lot of times you'd see a record and go, oh, that, that can't possibly be right. And sure enough, you get the specimens like, oh, no, yeah, they were right. <laughs> so that, that's, you know, the intuitive um, reason that people would blow in specimens or to maybe describe the species. Uh, but a lot of times you actually um, find reasons that people are looking at specimens you'd never predict, right? So somebody might be looking at something for some bioengineering purpose or for some design purpose, like, oh, I want to look at shark skin because I want to design a microplastic that inhibits bacterial growth. That really happened. Um, so a lot of times people are, are thinking about using specimens for things related to human health. Um, then we also have these amazing genetic resources. So in fishes, what um, I think is, is fun to tell people is we share about 70% of our genes with fish. Um, so that means fish, you know, they really um, do a lot of the same things that we do that all vertebrates do. Um, and so for my research, I'm really just generally interested in, you know, everybody talks about life on this planet and how certain lineages have gone extinct and other ones have diversified and they're the evolution's winners or losers is the way people like to paint that. Um, I'm just fascinated by what keeps everything around. How does stuff persist? If you think about tracing back the history of life, going back to our most recent common ancestor with all animals, um, or even further back, Right? We've all had to endure the same things throughout this history. And it's a terrifying time. You've got giant meteors, you've got volcanoes, you know, it's just like, you know, it's like if you're in a death metal band, it is like the most epic backdrop for your album. <laughs> and it's sort of humbling to think that the, you know, the whatever, if you're looking outside at a, at a pine tree or um, a beetle um, or, you know, your neighbor, we all of our ancestry, right, we've all had to persist through that amount of time. And I'm really fascinated by sort of what's happening at the genetic level that allows us to persist. Um, so the collections at the museum are wonderful windows into that. So we can look at genomes across lots of species and actually start to see what do these things have in common? What are these things doing differently? Um, so that's sort of what I'm looking at um, at the 30,000 foot view. Is that what you see the collection being used for most often? Is it researchers looking to look at genetic samples or take tissue samples of fish that are that are in the collection? Are they doing morphology or looking body shape, size? Or is it, it that locality <laughs> data that we know comes um, with this? It's literally all of it and more. Um, so on a, in a given week, um, it, you know, this week it could be you have a bunch of people who are, there are people really interested in the evolution of body shape and 
morphomet or the morphology or how an animal appears or its functional morphology through time and how that changes. Um, and you might have, have a, a period of time where a lot of people are looking at that. Then a week later, you might have people like actually see, like, I want to see T scan these things because I want to look at the evolution of vertebrate brains through time. Um, then a little while later, you have somebody who's like, I'm describing a new species. I need reference material. Then you might have somebody downloading millions of data records to try to map how species ranges are changing through time. So it's, it's always different. <laughs> so the collections are not just one thing. Um, so what, that's what makes them so wonderful and so valuable is that 20 years ago, if you were to tell people then what people are doing with collections now, their minds would be blown. And I'm sure that in 20 more years, our minds will be blown again as people find new uses for these materials. Chris, I think one of the ways to think about it is every single specimen that we have in the collection has a story to tell. And it's its own story, but it's also a story that comes from the questions that are asked by the people that are out there, whether they be the general public, um, agency personnel, researchers, educators, whoever that may be. And so that's why I feel like my job is so important. It's to maintain this collection so each specimen's story can be told. I don't know the the questions that can be asked. So all I can do is I can put all the information that I have, the specimen information, the locality information, any ecological information I have that goes with it, make that globally accessible. So those questions can be asked by the people out there that are coming up with these questions and have these amazing ideas. And so just like Alex was saying, every single loan or data request that we get is a different question by a different set of people, a different researcher, a different educator, whoever that may be. And so it's so beautiful to see that unfold. And it's been so beautiful to see that unfold because in my career, we went from paper data catalogs to going online and to see uh, the use of our collection increase 12 fold immediately when we went online that's the purpose and that's sort of the purpose behind my job and why because people ask me you know you, you you work with a bunch of dead stuff you take care of all these specimens what's it all for and i said well it's for those stories um and that's really the bottom line what are some of the like really cool or interesting stories then that you've uh heard or worked on out of the fish collection I mean, I've seen some amazing specimens like giant shark heads and puffer fish skulls, and there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. Uh, what stands out? One thing that stands out to me that's actually pretty recent within the last few years is we have um, sort of the, the rostrum or the front end of sawfish. And they're dry. They're in our skeletal collection. Um, they're beautiful. Sawfish are um, federally uh, listed. They're critically endangered. And so there's a group um, working on sawfish con conservation, and they wanted to see if they could get DNA from these sawfish blades, from these dry skeletons. And so we we had researchers come and actually take pieces of the skeleton and they were able to get DNA. And so that to me was just another level of, whoa, that's awesome. You know, that from these dried specimens, some that go back to the late 1800s, they were able to get DNA out of it. And so that's kind of one of the, the more recent examples, but you know, Alex, if you want to chime in with anything. Yeah, I, I don't, every week I feel like that's a shifting target too, because, you know, I'm, I, I kind of, I get excited about whatever the new shiny thing is. Um, so if somebody's doing something like, oh, it's so amazing. Um, but I, I guess um, one of my favorite things still is, is realizing just you can go into so many different levels with specimens. Um, so, you know, whether it's discovering that this gene that's really important, this is actually one of my favorites right now, is it's a gene that's really important for human cancer. Um, actually originates at the common ancestor of humans and lampreys um, and from there duplicates and then um, has kind of this reverse function in fishes that's reversed from what it does in primates. I mean, it's just so amazing to think that we can start tracking like things relevant to human cancer biology from, you know, something that's in the freezer, <laughs> right? you know, in a lamprey. Um, that to me is just incredible. Um, so what are some of the, um, like uh, if you're giving a tour of the collection, let's say, what are some of the specimens that you can't miss? If you're showing someone around you say, oh, before you leave, you have to see this jar. You wanna go first? No, you go ahead. 
Um, so, I mean, there's definitely some favorites. I mean, one of the more fun things is to show people shark jaws. So giant shark jaws are just an instant draw in. Um, and I think sharks are just kind of these malaligned um, animals that, um, you know, we, we personally, I, I, I dove a lot um, and have been told many times sharks swam by. I never noticed them. <laughs> um, and so we have, we've, you know, we by chance met up with a photographer once. He he's been on Shark Week and he films tiger sharks in Hawaii. Um, and you know, his he had this great quote that um, tiger sharks are one of the most feared. They can be dangerous, uh, but he said the sea is salty from the tears of tiger sharks because we stigmatize them so much. And that that to me that really stuck with me. Um, but um, some of my my favorite. Some of my favorite specimens are some of the real oddball ones. Um, so um, I love the stonefish is, is amazing. We don't think of fish as venomous, um, but the stonefish is the most venomous fish in the world. Um, and what's crazy about it is it's not a venom for um, capturing prey. So you think about like a cobra venom, right? It's going out and it's got, you know, this cocktail of neurotoxin. It's going to bite into you and you're going to stop breathing. Uh, the stonefish is a defensive venom. Um, so it shoots its venom from its spines on top of its back. Um, and so if you were to step on it, it's like stepping on a whole bunch of syringes that are upside down and on a pressure plate. So they just squirt right up. And um, that is a cocktail that's just designed for maximum pain. Um, and these guys, they live in tide pools or in intertidal areas uh, very near shore. And they can even survive out of water for really long periods of time. Um, so tide can go in and out and they're just sitting out of the water. So it's basically like finding the incredibly dangerous rock on the beach and not stepping on it. Um, and we have one in the collection that we actually found that way where we were out sampling at night and somebody we were with was like, this rock has eyes. <laughs> um, and they actually sit still so long they grew algae. So this thing was covered in algae and here it is, the you know, most dangerous, most venomous fish in the world uh, just staring back at you. Um, wow. Wow. Gabriella, what about you? I think um, it, it depends on the audience um, that we have, uh, for sure. But mm -hmm. one of the things that people love to see is um, we have a giant eyeball from an ocean sunfish in a jar. And it's probably about this big. And it's just kind of looking back at you. And it's actually had its picture taken and been in National Geographic. So it's a famous eyeball. And so everyone likes to come and see the famous eyeball. And that's pretty cool. And then, you know, we're able to talk about, you know, ocean sunfish um, from that and how, you know, they're basically gigantic plates swimming in the ocean. Um, and so it's it's pretty cool to, to talk about ocean sunfish. And we do have a baby ocean sunfish in um, our 10 foot uh, gallon tank. And so we can show that too. Um, which is really neat. Um, I also like to show um, a fish that's actually very common to North Carolina. It's the bluehead chub and it's a freshwater fish. It's a minnow and it's it's really cool. I would highly recommend people search online and look for pictures because the males, when they go into mating season, their heads turn a brilliant blue and they develop these things called tubercles. They look kind of like little horns all over their heads. And it's only during mating season. And they build these beautiful pebble nests in a stream. So if you're walking um, even small streams, like our, our stream at our Prairie Ridge Eco Station, you can see these nests in the spring. Um, they're sort of, they're rounded and mounded and all little um, pebbles on them. And then the, the males will guard them. And then all these other species come in and they're called nest associates because they actually lay their eggs in the nest and, and the bluehead chubs let them do that. They only guard against other bluehead chub males. So I like to show that because we do have some in the the collection that actually still have you know their their tubercles or those little horns that I was talking about on their head and then just talk about how cool that is and how people can see this you know in the streams in their you know in their backyard or close to where they're at or if they just wanted to go to Crabtree Creek or anywhere like that they might be able to see some bluehead chub nests so it's really cool yeah that I love the examples of the way that using the collection in that way you can make science and nature more accessible to people, right? It's here, here's something that it actually isn't from some far flung locale and we've collected it here because we think, you know, it's brightly colored and it's the most special uh, 
but it's something that's right in your backyard. And even those specimens have just as much value as something that we might think of as like an exotic fish that we, that we get from a collection or from someplace all over the world. Um, but, but they all have importance, right? They all help us tell a story, tell sort of a big picture. Um, I'm going to remind everybody watching, leave your, uh, there, I see comments coming in and there's a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to start grabbing questions from the chat box in just a moment. So type up your uh, questions, comments there. We'll be grabbing those and passing them along to Alex and Gabrielle in just a moment. But Gabrielle, you were about to say something very important and I interrupted. No, it's okay. Um, I was just going to throw in there too that, you know, every, you know, I think every, fish is important in its own way. And if we if we looked at bluehead chubs, and if bluehead chubs were removed from a stream, you slowly lose all of the nest associates within that stream, you know, over the year and over the, the couple years. And so like a lot of things can happen and change. And so not only can we look at this collection to say, okay, what was important when these things were collected or every specimen has its story to tell, but how can it help us to make decisions for the future, right? And how can it help us to actually go out and help nature ourselves, whether we're observing the creek in our backyard and maybe one year we see nests and another year we don't see, you know, bluehead chubs. Why was that? Was it temperature related? What's going on? Were they removed? Is there something going on upstream? So there's all these questions that can be asked. And I think you can pull one jar off of the shelf and really just open up a whole door for someone, you know? And it's the idea of, you know, back in the day, collections were just these curiosity cabinets that, um, you know, these old guys took care of, I mean, just to be honest, you know? And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and no one else really knew anything about them. And so over the years, as I've, you know, been a collection manager for a while, you know, my goal is sort of to, to remove that stigma, you know, it's not a, a behind the scenes basement, just curiosity cabinet thing. It's something that anyone can do. I'm just a regular person that just decided I love fish and this is something I want to do. And so there's nothing special, you know, I don't wear a white lab coat. Well, sometimes I do, but you know, you don't have to be a special person to do this. Anybody can do this. And so that's why we want to open the doors to our collections in various ways, whether it be by doing our tours, which we do for, you know, our members for sure, and for school groups and girls in science, but also by doing citizen science project where people come in, can, can help transcribe our data. So, you know, we really try to open the doors that way because I want to I want to remove that. I want people to see this is really cool. And if you really like this, um, you know, it's it's awesome. And there are jobs <laughs> for for people like us <laughs> that love to work in collections and organize and put out data. So I love that. I love all of that. That's a that's an amazing answer to that. Alex, um, were you about to add something? You were nodding along. Just oh, I just you. totally agree. I You're mean, like, yes. I don't know, I'm just a goofball. And, um, I, you know, I think it's, <laughs> you know, I always tell people everyone has the potential to be a, a great scientist. Just start asking questions. Um, and if you're, if you're curious, um, and engaged, um, it's all that matters. Um, so that's one of the, I think the greatest things about, about science is it truly is this, you know, global, there are no boundaries um, enterprise where we're all just trying to discover how things work. Um, and everyone has the potential to, to contribute. Um, all right, I'm gonna start throwing some questions your way from the chat. Sure. Uh, what is the biggest specimen in the collection? I can answer that. <laughs> the longest specimen we have, it's almost 13 feet and it's a thresher shark. And I'm able to fit it in our 10 foot tank because its tail curves around, you know, thresher sharks have that um, wild tail they thresh about. And so we're able to fit it into our 10 foot tank. That's our longest specimen. Our heaviest specimen is a bull shark that's actually also in the 10 foot tank. Um, and that's something that originally was part of the um, UNC Institute of Marine Sciences collection, which we incorporated into our collection. We received it back in 1996. And that specimen is really, really heavy. I can't remember exactly how heavy it is, but they wrapped back in the day, they put um, very thick, a boat rope around the body of the shark in order to lift it and carry it around. And that's still 
on the shark. And that's how we were able to move it from one tank to another. And it took four of us to move it um, into its new new home. So yeah, that's our heaviest shark. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, well, the next question is what's the smallest? Okay, so we have, I have, there's eggs in the collection. We have eggs of all various mm. specimens. Um, we have what are really cool, and I highly recommend people go look these up too. They're called leptocephali, and they're the larval form of certain species. Um, and they basically look like, I mean, to be honest, they look like thin noodles. Um, there's not much to them. <laughs> they see an eyeball and like this noodly shape. Um, and so those are probably our thinnest, um, narrowest and lightest specimens. And then of course the eggs. We do have a lot of larval specimens, which we received from um, Dr. Steve Ross, uh, who was with UNCW. And he did a lot of trawling off of our coast and in the Gulf of Mexico. And we have some wonderful deep sea larva collections. So we do have a lot of larval specimens. See the next one here. Are there any challenges that the ichthyology collections face that other collections may not have to deal with? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to go on that one? Go for it. So, um, yeah, there's, there's uh, a few actually. So for example, if you're looking at a collection that's mostly dry specimens, so whether they're shells or skins and mounts and things like that, they have to deal with other things like pests and pest control, which we also have to look at in our skeletal collection, things that are dry and just the skeletons, the bones. But the collection itself is all housed in 70% ethanol. And we have it in a humidity and temperature controlled room. We try to use the best jars and lids we can uh, up to today's you know, standards, but sometimes those seals don't work. And so we do have to do what are called ethanol checks. And that's basically looking at every jar once a year we go through and we do ethanol checks throughout our collection. And so that is very time consuming and um, it takes a lot of manpower, people power to do. Um, and so uh, that is definitely, um, definite. it's not a negative, it's just something we have to do. It's part of the job, you know, that we have to do because uh, mm -hmm. if something, dries out, you can try to rehydrate it, but it's not going to look the same. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be very difficult to take any sort of external characteristics and measurements off of it because it has dried out and then you've tried to rehydrate it. So you want to, to keep it in that ethanol um, environment. Um, and then, you know, there's cost involved. Obviously we have a 10 foot tank that's stainless steel that it was expensive. Uh, the ethanol is expensive. <laughs> the jars, the lit, you know, there's a cost involved in maintaining this collection. So you have to think about that too when, when starting it up and make sure that that's just, you know, part of your budget because my, my office supply is basically jars, lids, and ethanol, right? <laughs> I could, I could find scraps of paper, but <laughs> my office supply is jars, lids, and ethanol. So yeah. All right, this next question is definitely one for both of you. What fish has the best scientific name? Oh, That's a thinker, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I can give you mine. I always, I always okay, what's your, out. Chris, you go, what's yours? No, I, I am not a fish expert by any means, but I can remember this one, and I hope I can remember it correctly, Mola Mola. Yep. That's a good one, yeah. Um, that was easy to remember. That's Which a is good the, one. a species yeah. of ocean sunfish, right? Ocean sunfish Gabriella was talking about. Um, yeah, okay, great. Oh, gosh, right. that's a, oh, that's a tough, I mean, you know, um, I'm trying to think of like in North Carolina, you know, um, I mean, I'm kind of partial to uh, the Lumber River area. I like working in those Blackwater rivers. I think they're awesome. So I'd have to say swamp fish, Colagaster cornuta. <laughs> that's a really cool <laughs> Latin name. Um, and then of course, cause it's called a swamp fish and because it's slightly purple, which happens to be my favorite color. <laughs> ah, there we go. Excellent. Alex, Alex? Did, did you come up with one? I can't come, I, yeah. 
I really can't come up. This this really stumped me in, in terms. I can't come up when it's funny. Um, it's usually everything's funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> what about any any right of the now. trigger fish? <laughs> any of the trigger fish? Yeah, they have like none of them have great. Well, so there's Campidermis, um, which somebody, I don't know if this is true, but somebody told me that, it, that it's named after the shape of a Dutch shoe, um, <laughs> which you know, um, kind of has that shape. I don't know if that's true or not. I never actually verified that one. Um, but Okay, yeah. okay. Oh, let's <laughs> see. Uh, Alex, this question might be related to some of the research I know you've done kind of recently. Do we have any specimens that are considered extinct now? Um, and maybe that would be a good segue too to talk about some of the conservation work that goes on. Yeah, um, that's a good. Do we have any of the extinct darters in our collection, I, Gabriella? I, or do we not? We don't have the Maryland, the Maryland one. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, not off the top of my head. I don't think we have any. We have a lot of things that are highly threatened. Um, and um, if you were to ask that question with the way things are going in 10 years, the list is actually dangerously large um, in particular for you know, a lot of shark species um, and mm -hmm. quite a few oddball things with restricted ranges um, that are still persisting, but they're, they're just hanging on by a thread. Um, so a lot of these things, you know, we have a lot of things that, that we have in areas where their ranges used to be potentially larger. We don't see them in some of these areas anymore. So they're historic records. Then we have other things that we potentially are seeing now in areas where they weren't before. Um, so we, we are seeing some changes in ranges. Um, so um, with marine fish, you know, a lot of them, they are very widespread, um, especially like coral reef fishes tend to have very large ranges. Um, but then we are, you know, there are things that have become locally extirpated off of sort of you know, so that locally they're not present anymore, but in the broader range of sense, they're still present in patches. Um, so we have a lot of representation like that. Um, then we also have um, like a, an Arctic collection where we are seeing a lot of changes down in the Southern Ocean. Um, so there again, you know, they have so a lot of these things, they are continental in, in distribution, um, but we are seeing population level declines that are enigmatic. We don't know why, but suddenly things that were very abundant are coming up less abundant. Um, gotcha. We gotcha. work a lot with our state agencies to provide the historical data that they use to then be able to go out and continue to do surveys on some of these species that are declining, specifically within North Carolina, the Wildlife Resources Commission. They use all of our historical data to then make decisions about you know, where they're going to go in order to see if they can find the species back where they were and, and if they can spread it out further and find them in other places. And so that's, um, that's really awesome to see the use of that because as we are able to incorporate all of this data into our databases and make it globally accessible, we're just creating a better distributional, historic distributional picture of these species. And so that way we can go forward and make, you know, m more, educated and um, I don't know if that's the right term, but make better plans for species conservation in the future by what we have seen and we have collected in the past. And so um, that's our, our data is widely used by state agencies for that, um, for that purpose and for their planning purposes every year for what they're going to do. Yeah, and what's, what's pretty cool is if you put that in the, the framework of just where, not just our data, but remember all museum data is now interconnected. Um, so you can see where everyone else who has specimens also has data associated with those specimens or just data. Um, so you can also get a snapshot of, you know, where have we not sampled at all, <laughs> right? And a lot of times there are places right in our backyards that nobody has thought to look. Um, so when you're making decisions for one area, um, that might be based on a completely different area that's, that's overrepresented and this area might be somewhat different and is undersampled or, you know, vice versa. Um, so it's, it's really neat that now all of this data being aggregated, people, you know, people in, in charge of management decisions can, can pool it and actually see, okay, where do we have data from? What's the underlying assumption of that data? Uh, what data do we need? Um, before you, you start planning and investing in things only to find out that there's a problem with your base plan. Um, 
So yeah, you can, when you have that picture, you can definitely see those biases as out, you know, as Alex was saying, and you, and you can look at, you know, obviously like if, a, if there was a, a professor that was at a university and he took his class out, they probably went to the same places over and over and over, but three creeks over has not been sampled, you know, so you start to see that. And so that's, you know, you can definitely make better decisions that way by having this global approach to it. Uh, let's see, next question. Do you have any holotypes? You have to tell us what a holotype is. Go ahead, Gabriella. Um, so a holotype is um, the specimen or specimens that were used to name a species. Uh, so if you've got, um, for example, if you've got specimens where the male and females have different characteristics, you would definitely have a male and a female holotype so that people would know what they look like. Um, and so, yes, we do, uh, which is awesome. We have a, we, we have more of what are called paratypes. And so a paratype, so for example, if we were going to name, say I had gotten to name the blue head chub. So I would go out and I would collect a bunch of these blue head chubs and I would say, okay, I'm using this male and this female as my holotypes. And then I'm going to name all these other ones as paratypes. And the reason why that's done is because the holotypes are sent to one institution and the paratypes can be sent to multiple institutions. And so if we think back to the days of like World War I and World War II, um, when a lot of museums in Europe were bombed and collections were devastated and Recently, a collection in Brazil, a fire completely took it out. All of those holotypes are gone. So when that happens, you can then elevate paratypes to become, uh, they're not termed holotypes, I forget what the term is, but you can elevate them. So you'll still have a representative of that species and, and how it was named. I think that covers it. Alex, you got anything to add? No, just, you know, if you're just, if you're in the, in the business of describing species, holotypes are just incredibly valuable because um, they, they are the reference for that species. Um, mm -hmm. So what we're finding a lot now is as, as we're really zooming in, um, we're seeing that a lot of the things that we thought of as one species are in fact multiple species. So what are termed cryptic species. So we're very biased as primates, right? We're visual. So if things look the same or close to the same to us, it's the same thing. <laughs> right, that's that's our inherent bias. Uh, but you know, with with the aid of molecular tools, um, you know, we can now again see in our data um, that these are different. In fact, multi often different spe or multiple species present where we thought there was one. Um, or at times we actually think there are multiple different species, but it's just some variation. And it's in fact one species. Um, so being able to go back to that holotype and compare, oh, this thing over here, is it actually, oh, oh yeah, we did miss. It is actually somewhat different. Um, so there may even be morphological features that we missed um, as a result of it just being less obvious. Um, so we, holotypes are, are incredibly valuable. All right, there's just a few questions that are in the chat right now, and our, our time is beginning to come to a close. I don't want to keep you all all day. Uh, this is a good question. I don't know the answer to this one either. Glenn is asking, are fish colors pigment-based or structural? That's a good question. Um, largely, uh, there's a lot of, lot of pigment, um, but um, there is structural color in some species of fish. Um, so one of my, my favorite um, is, I think the genus is Ignoramia, I forget the common name, but it's, it's, a, it's a type of grunt that's in the Caribbean. And if you can find one in a collection, you can actually just hold it up to the light and it'll actually still reflect blue. Um, so similar to structural color in birds. Um, so what's, what's really neat about that is it's related to, closely related to a lot of reef fish is what this thing lives, um, it goes off the reef and then comes in at night to sleep and so it's up in the water column more. So that structural color actually aids to counter shading it. So it, um, you know, it's one, it's darker, it's darker on the top and lighter on the bottom. So something looking up at it won't see it and something looking down at it won't see it as easily. Um, where it's closely related to a lot of these like beautiful bright yellow this fish known as grunts. Um, so yeah, there's definitely, uh, you see a combination of, and then you, when you really start getting into color and reef fishes and patterns, it just gets, it just gets crazy with all sorts of regional variation. And um, we really don't have a good handle on um, color pattern diversity at all yet in fish. It's a really exciting area of research. Next one up. Uh, how many, I guess, uh, Lots or specimens in the collection are freshwater and how many are marine? North Carolina is diverse in that way. We have both. 
That's a good question. Um, gosh, I haven't pulled that query lately, but I would probably say that our collection itself is probably 60 to 65% freshwater. Um, and then, you know, 40, 35 to 40% um, marine. Uh, one of the things, and I mentioned this collection before, so back in 1996, we were offered the collection from the Institute of Marine Sciences, and our collection um, was, was really good at the time, but it wasn't as heavily based in marine specimens, and so the Institute of Marine Sciences collection was mostly all marine, and so that gave us a wonderful marine component to our collection, and we've had other collections that have come in, like um, the deep sea stuff from Dr. Steve Ross that came in and other smaller collections. And so that has really added to the marine component um, of, of the um, collection. The thing to remember is, you know, we're based in Raleigh and when the Brimley started, it, it, again, talking about collection bias, it's much easier to go to the Noose River or Crabtree Creek than it is to take a whole day to go to the coast um, and collect. They did a wonderful job of doing that um, and actually working with fishermen on the coast back in the day to get things that the fishermen necessarily weren't going to be able to sell and so they would give and uh, that things were mounted and put up. So the public of North Carolina could see them. But um, again, you know, we were based in Raleigh, so we're going to be more freshwater. But now I'd say it's probably about 60-40, don't you think, Alex? Yeah, it sounds about right. Um, yeah, part of it, the southeast is sort of a, a freshwater biodiversity hotspot. So there are a lot of species of freshwater fish in the, in the American southeast. Um, so it's, it's not surprising that we have a huge representation of those. Um, and, Have either um, of you discovered new species or named new fish? Um, I, I've, I've discovered a cryptic species and asked someone else to describe it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, as I, I don't have the expertise in actually doing descriptions, to be honest. Most of my work is um, gen, like doing genetics and thinking about kind of comparative genomics. Um, so I'd prefer that somebody really with that background do it justice. Um, we do, uh, I will bring up a point, we do have some undescribed species of fish in North Carolina, so there are some chances for people out there, jump on it, I'd say, um, for describing some species. Uh, we have quite a few, actually, so that would be really good. My, my work is mostly distributional based, and so, um, yeah, I, I'll leave that out there to somebody that wants to dive into it, although I wouldn't say no um, to describing a species, but one thing I wanted to point out, because in the last question, and somebody said lots versus specimens. Um, and that may be something people don't understand. So a fish collection is normally cataloged in lots. And what that means is each jar is a specific species at a specific collecting event. So it could just be one specimen in that lot, or it could be 20 specimens in that lot. And so in our collection, we have about 110,000 lots, which equal about 1.4 million specimens. So that's sort of the difference there for people that, that didn't know that that's how we do our collection. Oh, no. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's just two more questions. So we'll hit them quick before, before our time is up, because I think I've kept you too long already. Uh, if anybody wants to be like you or work with you, what do they have to do? Studies, internships, volunteer, citizen um, science. So, so I, I always just um, I, I tell people the best career advice is just to, you know, go forth and try stuff and just show up um, and the opportunities will just happen. Um, for, for us in particular, we have internship opportunities, volunteer opportunities, and um, you know, just it's just an availability-based thing. If there, if we have, it's just a fire code issue, right? <laughs> Where it's like, if we have physical room, um, all are welcome. We're willing to try. Um, we really, anybody who is motivated and interested, that's the only criterion we have. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a question of, you know, just do we have space or is the museum open? <laughs> you know, those sorts mm -hmm. of things. Um, but I, I think in terms of career advice, a lot of times what I see people getting held back on is really hesitant to be like, I don't know if this is right for me. I don't know if I'm qualified. I don't know if I can do this. It looks so, you know, it's like, no, anybody can do anything. Just do, <laughs> um, you know, maybe somebody has a little bit more background than you, or, you know, that's intimidating. Don't worry about it. You'll get there. 
um, the greatest thing you can do is just try and try. And maybe the first opportunity doesn't work. Maybe it's not the right fit, but just try something else. Um, and so I didn't choose this path personally because um, I, you know, it was like, I'm going to do this. It was just, you know, through a series of, you know, coincidences and meeting people and just stumbling into things. And I think that's just sort of the way a lot of people's journeys through life go. Um, so that's my, my motivational speech, I guess. <laughs> I think one of the things to remember, and, and I like to tell people is follow your passion. Yeah. You know, um, you can have a job or you can have a career. And I think that having a career should really involve being passionate about it and being able to handle some of the things that aren't necessarily fun that we might have to do because there is the passion behind what we're doing. And that's really important. Um, the other thing I always like to tell people is try everything. So if there's an internship, try it. If volunteer, shadow somebody, try to get a glimpse into what an actual work week in these different um, careers will look like. And if that's something you're going to be able to be passionate about and do. And then don't think that I'm going to start here and I'm also going to end up there. Like things can change. Things can happen. You know, careers evolve just, <laughs> just as everything else does. And so I think that, you know, remember that as you're going into it. Um, the other thing to remember is, you know, don't ever be intimidated by those you see around you as a Latina in science, as a female Latina in science. You know, when I started out, I was the only woman um, in my group when I was studying and I was the only Latina, and, but I did not let that um, hold me back. I had a wonderful uh, uh, professor and advisor in college and in graduate school, which was amazing and helped me through it. But find those mentors. If, if there's not somebody within your core group that you're studying with, Find those mentors that do either look like you or you can relate to that will help you to get through what you need to get through in order to reach that career goal you're looking for. So I, I would recommend internships, volunteering, mentoring, um, shadowing, whatever you can do. Like Alex said, put yourself out there um, and just follow your passion because anyone can do it. I mean, I, I would also say, you know, like you have to be really goofy. I feel like I'm pretty goofy. Um, and, uh, and just, you know, and enjoy the process too, as you're going, as you're going through these internships, even if you decide that that's not the career you want to do for yourself, enjoy the process, enjoy the learning process of it and take something from it. Um, so th that would be sort of my, you know, suggestions. <laughs> that's beautiful advice. Absolutely excellent stuff. Okay. This is the last one that I see in the chat. Uh, do you have any torpedo rays in the specimens? I think there's a yeah. fan of torpedo rays. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely do. Yeah, um, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Right, it was there you a, go. One of my favorite electric ray stories I heard was from a, a, um, one of my, my uh, person I used to dive with. Um, she runs a dive shop out in New England and she took somebody out and it was, it was one of these these guys who just can't be told no, you know, and so they, they're they underwater and, and yeah, this guy decides he's going to poke an electric ray and you can imagine what happens, It's but it's it's kind of comical, he's fine. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, one of these like, wow, uh, what are people doing? Um, but yeah, we have, a, we have a, a really cool ray store, a really cool um, collection of, of rays. Um, which yeah, I think are they're just awesome animals, um, and and it's sort of like a a bonus answer to that. Um, if you ever look at a shark fin, um, you know sharks they kind of swim like this, um, so the the same bones or the, you know whatever they're called um, in the side of the shark. If you if you, a ray is basically just a shark that has done this and gotten stuck. Um, <laughs> if you ever had a chance to look at the anatomy of a ray, um, this is really just a way to think about how something like like that has evolved. Um, 
You know, Chris, I can just throw out there that um, mm -hmm. anyone's welcome to search everything we have, our collection, all that we have globally accessible at this point. You can go to the museum's website and then at the top, click on online collections under uh, research. And that will take you to all the collections and all the data that we have database. And you can search by um, Latin name. You can search by common name. You can search by collector, by year. There's all these different ways to search and then you can even map it. So if anyone's interested in um, thinking Things that we have, feel free to search that way. If you don't find it on there, you can also reach out to me because there we are still in the process. Um, currently, we have over 1.2 million of our specimens are databased and globally accessible, but we, you know, we have to reach that 1.4, um, and so we still have some things that that are that we're processing. So feel free to reach out to me if you can't find it on the online collections database. Excellent work, Alex Gabriella. Thank you so much for sharing the fish collection with us today. Oh, thank Thanks for having you, us. everybody for watching. And yeah, folks, if you've got more questions, check out naturalsciences.org and just browse the site, check out the research tab. You can see information about all of the different collections and research units that are at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Explore the online collection. Uh, there's so much great stuff to see at the museum's website. Just take a moment to check it out. Uh, you can also follow the museum on social media. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, but you can also like and subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel right here. As we continue through Museum Week, this is where we'll be posting uh, our future conversations tomorrow through Friday with some of the other collections staff. We'll be talking about more of the great stuff hanging out at the Museum of Natural Sciences. So uh, one big round of applause for Alex and Gabriella. Thank you so much for sharing your inside expertise and some cool stories with us. And uh, everybody in the chat box is clapping hands emojis and saying thank you for doing this. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> All right, everybody. Again, we'll be here tomorrow at noon to chat with uh, uh, the Malacology, our mollusk collection and the research curator for that, Arthur Bogan. So. That's right here at noon tomorrow. I hope we'll see you then. Bye, everyone.